I'll talk about Star Wars anytime you want. No, I'm good. We're good. No. <laughs> no. Saying things like get a room and now tell me what you really think. And the, these banal cliches are like like the equivalent of bumper stickers and t-shirts you buy in Florida. Fuck that shit. You know, I'm I will I have I'm having I, I offered to take breakfast, take take breakfast with Dean uh in June when I'm in town. I'm gonna be in New York between two shows. Um and unfortunately Dean does not see morning. Dean's relationship with the morning is one of a coma. So um you know, I suggest that he meet me for breakfast at be ni at nine thirty or ten and ten o'clock in, in the morning, giving anybody in his right mind an opportunity to get up and have breakfast. But no, Dean still lives like he's in, living in a college do dormitory, and uh, his frat brothers let him sleep in. So uh, I'm meeting him for coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, what the fuck? My accommodations to this this fifty five year old adolescent man boy. You know, I hope you're listening to this, Dean, because you're busy writing and taking notes. Uh, you know, I mean, fuck that guy. You know, bear in mind, I've, I've known him since he was a boy, and now, and now he's an old boy. You know, get a room, my ass. I come of an era of of collapsed dignity, you know, and uh, I, I'm a great believer in, in at least the imposition of dignity. Some a couple of years ago, um, I was I was on Facebook, which according to uh, to 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 re recent reports is for old people and, and racists. So uh, I'm an old person. So I'm okay. I'm good there. I I posted a a series of pages from the second trade paperback of Hey Kids, which were uh, short pieces about a character named Noah Gitlin, who was a clearly illy disguised avatar of me. Okay, I mean I deny it. I may, but I can't get away with it. And um, this Canadian cartoonist. I use cartoonist with, with air quotes. If I use air quotes, I don't do air quotes. Um, criticized me for um, the way I depicted the genes and the way I, I, I depicted it, I used two, two heads of similar expression. His, his presumption was based on his own inadequacy because what he was pointing to was precisely the narrative a gesture that I was making. But I, I, I began to, just, to explain this to him and then I said, fuck this guy. Why, why do I waste my time explaining to myself to someone who is utterly so completely bereft of nuance, whose whose standards of excellence boil down to that new Spider-Man comic book, suck a dick. I mean, really now? I mean, I so so basically, I did the I did the Facebook thing and I unfriended and blocked him. So he's somewhere in Canada, wondering why this old Jew doesn't speak to him anymore. But wonder no more. And you know they're always watching. It's like none of this shit matters, and if it matters to you, you're online too much. Uh, I just, you know, I, my, my, I, I have one response. It's, you come to my page and insult me, or is there irony that I'm missing here? And if, and if the answer is, you know, you know, we're just a bunch of comic book loving guys, or, or the equivalent of that, shunt it into the netherworld. Shunt, be shunted. You know, I, I was, I was in an exchange a couple of, couple of weeks ago, maybe months now, because time collapses for old people. Um, with a colleague of mine and a third person came up and, and this this colleague of mine in a private moment said, why is he, I, that guy drives me crazy. And I said, it's because he presumes that because we were all created equal, he is your equal professionally. And that's just not the case, you know? Uh, I, you know, I bought, I bought my, my place at the table by dint of hard work, emotional blackmail and slavery, okay? So I earned where I stand, okay? And some MOOC, who makes his living showing up at conventions drawing pictures of C-3PO is not my fucking equal. You know, sorry. It just, you know, being a comic book artist and drawing, making drawings that look like comic book drawings are two very disparate ideas, okay? They are very different. And, um, and you know, and, and, and this colleague of mine who is a very, very skilled professional said, no shit, I, I never, he wouldn't put it together because he was so committed to the concept of equality and equity. And, you know, the, the idea that, such a thing as an endowment as opposed to, or a grant, as opposed to a status which is earned is so fucking alien to modern culture. It's astonishing to me. You know, Gil Kane, who was a mentor of mine, died never acknowledging that he had transcended his own influences, which was a constant argument we had. And he was not a, a humble man by any means. He was self-aware, 
But he could not ever identify the fact that he, he had transcended the people who, who had influenced him. Not, not all of them, but some of them, certainly. And I, to a certain extent, don't feel that I have, I have, I have either. But on the other hand, in some other ways, I have found other avenues and, and means to achieve a higher state of grace, if not by those tenets and elements that I, that I, by which I was influenced, but rather through other means of, of ascendancy. You know, I'm, I'm being oblique because I don't want to hurt people's feelings, even though they're dead. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah. Five minutes into it and we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Good. But not, but hurting people's feelings, I, I mean, I, I am very committed to hurting people's feelings on purpose. Um, accidental hurting people's feelings is really an anathema. It really it makes my head explode. You know, particularly when, you know, when it's, when, if it's an accident, if it's on purpose, I'm good. You know, I'm okay with that. You know, there are people I, I mean, I don't wish anybody dead, but I certainly anticipate reading obituaries. You know, I, um, I, I am who I am. Like, like Alban says in La Caja Fall, I am what I am and not what I am. You know, whatever. Douglas Hodge, maybe, or George Hearn, depending on which version you've seen. My gap in uh, musical theater? The Cumberland Gap is what you're telling me. It's, sure. It's, it's, if, it's, if you want to talk about Japanese cinema or... No, no, what? I know nothing about it. <laughs> I grew up in New York City, in Brooklyn, in Queens, in Staten Island, in Manhattan. And my entire childhood is informed by the American Western. Um, it's what I watch all the time. Um, my entire... My, 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 my socialized ethos derives from Westerns. For me, like the samurai wanderer, the gunslinger wanderer is something that appeals to me. And it's just this like constant story. I think I think it's the outfits. I think it's the uh, it's the presentation of morality. When I was a little boy, what is now the PBS station in New York City, WNET, in those days was a chicken shit, uh, low, low, low wattage uh, shit ass station out of Hackensack, New Jersey. And they had two forms of program. I have no idea what happened after eight o'clock at night because I was in bed because I was a little boy. But they had two kinds of programming. They showed cartoons, and they were always the shittiest cartoons. They showed the Perry, the, the Paul Terry cartoons, which is just the crap. Then they showed Republican monogram westerns. So I was steeped in the work of Johnny Mac Brown, Wild Bill Elliott, Don Red Barry, uh, Ken Maynard, uh, Tex Ritter. These these low budget pictures that were shot, you know, in in what is now Chatsworth, California, where there's where the freeway runs through it. When I first moved, when I first came to California, I visited the rock that the Lone Ranger would ride by all the time. You know, a fiery horse, a speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hardy high of silver. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear as the Lone Ranger rides again. This is a, an enormous part of me, and, and to find my morale, my more, my, my, the system, my morality. When I realized, when I came to understand that there was an entire cinema out there in Japan, which had borrowed its ethos from the Western and transposed it to the samurai, I was unavailable to it. It was perplexing to me, and that that that's that's potentially an aspect of my of my xenophobia. You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe maybe, maybe that, that that's how my how, how xenophobia acts itself out me. I don't know. I mean, let's face it. I mean, the, those cowboy heroes would have just as soon rode over me with with, with a stagecoach. Right, this little Jew, let's ride right over this motherfucker. You know. So I, I have my identification with them has everything to do with it. With a you know those a bib front shirt. One of the the. The places I visited when I first came to Southern California was nudies of Hollywood, nudies of Beverly Hills. Now, nudies is forgotten now, but nudies was a uh, a tailor. N nudie was a little a little Russian guy, and he was like like five feet tall, a little Russian Jew. Nudie Cohen, his real name was 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 one of those. As Walter would say, Bibbly Bobkinish, you know, one of those really you know unpronounceable Russian Jewish names, um, who set himself up as a guy who made custom tailored cowboy clothes for cowboy stars. And I couldn't afford what I wanted. What I wanted was a, you know, a, like an outfit like Graham Parsons wore on the front on the first album, The Guilt of Palace of Sin, and the Flying Brito Brothers. But I got a bib front shirt and I had a, there were a number of photographs of me circulating when I still had a good body wearing a Nudies of Beverly Hills t-shirt. It was just one of the greatest experiences of my life because it was get, get an opportunity in my 20s to touch base with what had been a so formative and transformative aspect of my boyhood. Um, it, was, it was one of the ways I bonded with many, many men in the comic book business from all political stripes and of all generations. Speaking of, of nudies of, of, of Hollywood, I'm reading Palomino by Stephen Frank, the second volume. Um, Stephen is a, um, uh, a, an emigre who came over to the States to work in animation. He works, he's a player in animation. 
who's done an absolutely brilliant crime comic book that takes place in the 1980s in the in the Barstow Bernardino San, uh, San Bernardino and Bakersfield music culture of North Hollywood called Palomino, which I cannot recommend highly enough. I'm listening to uh, Fred Van Lente's first first major a major novel called Never Sleep, which is about female Pinkerton agents in the 19 in, in the 1860s. It's really good. It's really really good. I like Fred anyway, but you know, even, even if I didn't like Fred, I'd like his book. You know, because I can separate the art from the artist. Coc for this in this instance, Alex Toth. The I just finished reading a a, a novel that that there's a, there's a whole sub sub subgenre of now of fiction that. Bernard Cornwell started in the 1970s with the Sharp novels. There are guys writing all these pastiches that reflect the Sharp sensibility. Uh, Simon Scarrow writes his series about his uh, his centurions. And I just started a new novel about a guy who is a an aristocrat in France whose family is murdered, who becomes a member, who becomes a, a, a sergeant and rises through the ranks of Napoleon's army. It's a pot boiler, but I'm digging it. You know, uh, I'm on issue five of Hey Kids, Volume Three. I'm expecting to see pages from uh, from Gustavo today. Uh, Ken Brusenek is back in the saddle after having uh, neck surgery. As he described himself, he has a sore throat and a Frankenstein scar, but he's ready to go. And, um, you know, just having a good time. For all of my bitterness, rancor, and obnoxitude, I am blessed and happy for every day that I wake up. And, that's, and that, that, that may sound treacly, but fuck you. It means I mean every word of it. I, I'm quite serious. I I had absolutely no idea that I would be feel this good this late. And it's late. I'm late. You know, typically my, my work doesn't sell. Nobody buys my stuff because it doesn't hit the uh the 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 genre, you know, butt points as I you know, as I continue to antagonize the audience, you know, listing the things that I find repellent with superpowers from space, in space, with dragons. The sadness I feel for the ambitions that I that uh, for writers in comics who are forced to channel those ambitions through such utter utterly incomprehensible drag <laughs> is just astonishing to me. It's fantastic. I had a, I had a post from a guy who I know on Facebook. I've met him in person a couple of times. Who just recently read the Divided States of Hysteria? Who somehow as he said he somehow had missed it, and he, he described it as the, as the, the best horror comic book he'd read in years, which flattered me no end. And I, it was it was a very thoughtful, very very pleasant post. I was very I was very gratified and flattered by it. That said, you know I take neither praise nor blame seriously. I don't read reviews of any kind, good or bad, because if I take if I get a, if I if I'm pissed if I take the, the the positive review seriously, it means I have to take the negative one seriously too. And I just who cares what you fucking think? I mean, really. Once again, this goes full circle. It's just they don't know you. It doesn't even matter. It's just people talking at you is just white noise. I'm working on a, a in, in the beginning stages of a new Substack piece called Middle Mensch, which which discusses the idea of of where where you know a an iconoclast stands on on the social cultural stage, and how difficult it is to be taken seriously in a world in which you are allowed to have one idea and one opinion about that idea, and that that the idea that just because I disagree with you doesn't mean I agree with them is complex and, and and daunting for so huge a part of the of, of, of the community um i mean i i have i have a a lifelong aversion to multiculturalism just because um i believe it balkanizes i think we are seeing the the the, the residue of that balkanization right now um i think that the create trying to cre at least the efforts in temp in attempting to create a homogenized culture is valuable for a nation, you know. I mean, you and I are 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 not in any way part of the ethnic story, the, the ethnic origins of our nation. You know, we are we do not represent uh, that that shining city on the hill as as perceived. You know, um, but you know we're here, and you know there there the rules are played, and we play by the rules. You know, look at you. You know, we're both we're both you know vaguely suspicious in our presentation. You know? It's just that thing that people don't get. You walk into a room and you you feel it. You just kind of feel this like they know. <laughs> they, <laughs> they they know, but they don't know enough about what they know. You know, it's, it's they're, they're they're limited in their knowledge. It's fantastic. You know, I mean, and and again, it's I went from being in, in I I barely graduated from high school, and I I was a 
an introvert and completely and totally shut down, terrified of everything. I mean, I just, I had no friends. My only friends were comic books and television and movies and food. And then I discovered drugs and everything changed. And I went from being this kind of like nothing character to a, having a pregnant girlfriend. <laughs> like, boom, you know, you know, and 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 I, you know, there there are people in my, I mean, I I haven't used drugs or alcohol in you know over thirty years, and one of the one of the things you, have, my worst day drink, my worst day not drinking is better than my best day, and that's nonsense. I had a great time, I had a really fabulous time. It got bad in the last five years, but it was pretty good while it was going on. The residue of it is this, you know, the fact that I am completely comfortable in my own skin. And, and capable of functioning in a, in a world which uh, is frequently indifferent to hostile. The reality is, you know, assimilation is next to impossible in, in, in the most perfect way. But I do whatever I can to live by those terms and standards. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a visitor here. I mean, I'm second gen, you know, but I'm also, you know, regarded by, look, I live in a redneck town. <laughs> face it. I mean, it's like, Oh, there's the Jew and there's the black guy. Let, let's go visit, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, I, and I and I recognize the fact that I I, I don't live up to the to, to people's assumptions about who I am or should be. We'll get to the comics thing later because people are going to listen to this and be like, why aren't they talking about Star Wars? But it's that thing where you see people. I'll talk about Star Wars anytime you want. No, I'm good. We're good. No, <laughs> no. I, 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 have a, I have a 15 minute pitch <laughs> whenever you're ready. It's that thing also where you see whether it's you make something and people want you to be whatever version of you that they first ran into. Again, it's the thing you've talked about this. It's that resistance to change where right. it's just they want that stasis. They want you to be like a static object that they can return to so they don't have to self-regulate. And this is when the comic book people tune out because we're talking about being human beings instead of just being like um, the, the, content the processing machines. Living. Right. Well, look, I mean, um, one of the things about comic books, about mainstream comics, as I've said this recently, and I'll say it again frequently until really I'm dead, is that the franchise and model of mainstream comic books is a Mobius strip comparable to the to the Roadrunner Coyote cartoons of Chuck Jones, uh, in which closure does not exist, in which the there, there's there's an, there's there's occasional obscuring of the fact that there is no closure, but you're you're dealing with a marketplace that. That actively that that is neither not, not even unaware or uninterested or indifferent in character development, but hostile to character development, because character development would imply a transformation of idea. And that, you know, that 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 character development in comic books is defined by whether spy, whether Batman has a yellow circle around his Batman symbol, or whether he's, you know, or the Spider-Man is wearing a black, more black outfit than red. The the the, the, the corporate nature of how, how much corporation get corporation as this, as this vast concept get and derive from un unpaid, completely willing free merchandising brought to you by the fans. You know, I mean, hating something doesn't unsell it. The to toxic fandom, proprietary fandom, owning this stuff, thinking that you have a right to it is, is an absolutely bad. I mean, I say it's bad shit, but I recognize the fact that it's direct, it's direct corollary is in video games. Uh, video games are a are, are medium in which the player participates dramatically in the contextual outcome of the material, which I find completely ridiculous. I, I, I don't, choose your own adventure is not my idea of a way I want to live. And I, I first experienced this, I, 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 pu I posted this in a, in a subsex screen some months back. I was on a panel about miniseries when they were a new thing. And one of the one of the attendees made a remark to the effect that he didn't like miniseries because he couldn't write the letter letter to the editor to 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 affect in some way the outcome of the narrative. And I was like, "What? I'm pissing in the wind, you know? I mean, I'm I'm so easily dismissed as the as the old man yelling, get off my lawn, simply by dint of the fact of of having an opinion in which." Um, saying that 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 banality of tell me tell us what you really think is regarded as a form of of, of cleverness. Um, I, I try to explain to people, I mean, I'm not funny, but I'm clever and I'm quick and I'm witty. Don't, don't come into my room on my page and think you can compete with me on my terms. You are wasting your time and going to piss me off because I'm much better at this than you are. You know, it just is. I mean, I'm, I'm that guy. It's got me into any, any amount of trouble over the years. 
got me married too. But the truth is most comic book people are perfectly happy and perfectly satisfied with, with utterly puerile junk. And their tastes are now justified by the fact that the material has become the lingua franca of mass media. I recently gave a shot to the first episodes of two, two SF television series, neither of them Star Wars or Star Trek based, I might add. And I realized that I had absolutely, I was utterly unengaged. The leaps I was being asked to make about in these things, about, about the world in which these things took place. And one of them even took place in a very, in, in just only a couple of years into the future, into the future, into the future. I just didn't care. I really like, I like, I embrace, I engage with human scaled conflict, you know, stuff that really matters to people as opposed to spaceships and dragons and dis diaspora and dystopia. I just don't care. It may be a character flaw because I'm obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been sidelined by history and reality, but I'm okay. People are going to watch this or listen to it and be like, is this the one? Is this the one where he's going to, is this his final interview? <laughs> he does it all the time. <laughs> um, but, but hey, kids, volume three, first two issues of the, of the third and final volume are out. Yes. Um, it's called The Schlock of the New, um, which is a tribute to Robert Hughes. Many, many comic book fans are very much aware of the of the, the work of Robert Hughes. That's a lie, by the way. No one knows who Robert Hughes is. Robert Hughes is an, a great, a, 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 an outlaw of, uh, art critic who came, Australia, from Australia who died very young. But it's about fandom, um, and it's about how comic books owes, owes its very existence, both in, in good and bad, to, to fandom. And um, the fact that, as, as, as I've said in the book, that, that comic books, when you're a comic book person, you are inoculated with comic books. They, they they become part of your ecosystem. It's very different from fandom of, of rock and roll or or science fiction fandom. Um, you know, you 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 accept whether you like it or not. You accept the fact that there are people out there who love the same things you do, who dress up like these fucking people. That that's like it's it's like you may say, why the fuck are you doing that? But it's like okay, you know. And they've been doing it forever. It's not new. I've outgrown the content that, that has been shoved in me for years and years and have, I've learned to embrace the form. And I love the form enormously. Um, and Hit Kids, to a certain extent, is about that. You know, it's about the struggle to find meaning in what is utterly meaningless. I'm sure you've dealt with this where it's people talking about, oh, it's so bitter or whatever, but there is the love of comics in there. Like, there, there, there are so many moments where it is the actual appreciation without the fetishization. But it, it kind well, of looks but, at all but, of those angles as well, where it's like you're, you're yeah. it starts off when you're a kid and it's like the best thing ever. And then you grow up and you, the rose colored glasses come off. Yeah, but, but Stan created this entire cultural environment that we're all just a bunch of comic book loving guys with cool nicknames and shit like this. Fuck you. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the, I mean, my generation was, was not bitter, mostly because we came in knowing what, what to expect. And as, as I've said more than once, when I hear that comics will break your heart, kid. There's an unspoken narcissism in that, that what, what that says is, I've seen it happen to everybody else, it's not going to happen to me. But it does, it always happens. And the expectations of comics, so inoculative from the beginning, they, because they begin as a hobby, and now in my case, they end as a hobby as well. The material is, is so part of your bloodstream that you can't get around it. When, I, when I'm at conventions and I see a couple come up to the table, my first question to the woman involved is, are you the patient wife? They will often back off from this because it's exactly what they are um, putting up with their husband's, you know, alternate fetish. It's, I think it's funny. I did. There's a point in issue two under Sid Mitchell's description that says, hates the deal when hired by others, delighted to offer the same terms to those who work for him. Uh, yes. Is that connected to what you were talking about? Well, I, I think, I think comics is a, you know, Andre Gregory in, in my, in my dinner with Andre described New York city as a, as a prison in which the citizens are both jailers and guards my understanding of the way things worked was that anybody put in the position of, of, of being able to exploit others, exploited others. They all got away with it until they didn't. I think one of the reasons why, why Stan was able to get away with his exploitation was that Stan early on figured out a way to, by implication, be responsible for his own salvation. That he, was, he rescued himself from, 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 the, uh, from what looked like a dreary, pointless life. And that, and that was because the people who identified that rescue were incapable of, of identifying the skill set required to do what I do in terms of drawing, but they got to identify the skill set involved with writing. And they also responded to someone who, who really was comparable to Sammy Glick from What Makes Sammy Run by Bud Schulberg. 
by a guy who was a, a hustler and a salesman. All the things that I regard as, 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 as kind of distasteful aspects of his character are things that were really embraced by the corporate structure that ultimately embraced and, 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 and engulfed this material. The, the very fact that phrase art chores makes my head explode, implying that, you know, that the, the, the separation of labor and management. I, I was thinking this, I was driving home from the Santa Barbara, I dropped my wife off at the airport. I was driving home from the airport and I, I was thinking about one of the problems with working Marvel style is a desperate, a need for exp exposition. It, it, you're constantly finding yourself endlessly explaining to the reader. And I have utter contempt for the need to explain to my reader. My, I, I want my reader to join me as opposed to, need, to, to desperately need exposition. Uh, and comic books are based on characters telling each other what they think and how they feel about what what everyone else is in the books. And that that, that strikes me as lazy nonsense. When I talk about fans, when I say you, I mean we, you know, because I was a we, and I was, I was, I was too shy and embarrassed to behave in the way some of these people do. I mean, I, you've heard me talk about Simonson's law. Simonson's first law is a comic book fan will always tell you the truth, particularly if it's unpleasant. We're constantly surfeited by this. You know, Chaykin's first law is a fan will always tell you how much they love your stuff, and then include all the other artists they love, too, particularly including those who hold in complete contempt inevitably inevitably i imagine that gets draining after a while where at some point you just had to learn to like hold your tongue it's like this fight isn't worth it it's like pick your battles this one isn't worth it people draw anecdotally the first cover of the first issue of, of hey kids volume three is of a, of a teenage kid standing in front of an nra poster the nra being the national recovery administration and as i said recently People presumed it was the National Rifle Association, that I was making some comment about fascism. And I was insulted, not so much because they were too stupid to know that it was the NRA National Recovery Administration, but that they would think I was so banal and puerile as to make so overt and obvious a statement in so overt and obvious a way. I mean, I've said more than once that superhero comic books are simply about liberal ends achieved by fascist means. And the franchise of If We Do It, It's Okay uh, informs this work enormously. But the... The very nature of, of the material that, that grown men and women embrace in this work, and it's mostly men, you know, women have, have have come to this work, but that's after they were driven away by men in the first place, because, you know, my, my generation was responsible for dispatching a female audience and a female readership in comics uh, by, by killing romance comics off, you know, to a profound extent. It's a predominantly boys medium, and on one hand, you have you know, a, a, a newly evolving, you know, progressive wing of comic book people who are obsessed with the concept of inclusivity and diversity, uh, but only in a very specific and an inclusive way, an exclusive way. And on the other hand, you have the bromosexuals, you know, who are, you know, committed to this idea of butch masculinity without acknowledging just how much it resembles Tom of Phoenix, Tom, Tom of Finland paintings. You know, the some years back, there was this female artist who was doing a tutorial on YouTube about how to desexualize superheroines. And I, why don't you do it to the guys too? Because let's face it, those booties on those guys look pretty hot, you know? Um, the, the sexualization of the human body is is both male and female in comic books. And basically, uh, you know, I, years ago, a friend of mine who briefly assisted Woody dismissed Gil Kane's work. This is in the mid 60s when Gil really sort of put himself through the next level of his own transformation into, into what he ultimately became as as drawing no more than a flayed figure and i said yeah that that that's his his the way he's depicting it he's basically applying a combination of burn hogarth and george bridgman to, to the comic book figure what it was was basically the visible man with the with the exterior skin the dermis removed just the muscle all the muscle being visible um and it was the way he could think about it in those terms um but there's a, a I mean, <laughs> one of my colleagues wants to miss this, miss another colleagues as saying that guy drew the best male asses on superhero comics I've ever seen in my life. You know, thank you. That wasn't me. This, this serious, this very serious discussion of like, does Batman give head? All of that stuff that makes me want to jump out of a window. I, I always thought he was blowing Alfred, you know, but. Uh, you know, I was going to the, say that. It's like, we know what Batman's into. Batman <laughs> is into getting. We kind of talked about this last time. Um, who are you talking about when you were talking about, like, someone mentioned Fan and his reaction was venomous. Mike Esposito. Mike Esposito. Right, okay. Mike Esposito. So was, the way... Was really... <laughs> the, and I was going to say the way uh, Ken Bruznik letters that moment in this panel is, like, one of my favorite single moments of his lettering ever. I think it's just worth the price of admission. 
I, and by the way, his first draft was much too restrained. Really? <laughs> I said, oh yeah. I mean, I mean, I very specifically that was one of the one of the points where I said, let's pump that up just a little bit, you know, and let's sell that loathing, you know. The, the waft one lines. Of the, one of the things about Ken is that I know full well if I ask him to dramatize something, he's going to dramatize it. I have no fear. I mean, I told you that you know when I when I did the hey, when I did Vited States when I suggested he use something that 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 then current phrase internet chatter that I, I was expecting something like a little button here and there. What he gave me was a page encompassing series of, of, of obscure nonsensical graphics that really sort of informed the material. And, you know, Ken is the best at what he does. You know, he really is. In this case, I, in the first draft of it, I thought he was being much too restrained. And I really wanted to convey the moisture of the lubriciousness of that disgust. I mean, Esposito, I, I, I never knew Mike, Mike and Ross particularly well. But I, I mean, I was a big fan of them when I was a kid. I loved, I loved the Wonder Woman stuff they did with Kaniger because it was, I knew how terrible it was and I still loved it just the same. And then I outgrew it because it was like, oh, this is stupid shit. And then Gil Kane reinformed me with my appreciation for Ross Andrew. Um, he really, he said, you've got to, you know, you got to stop, you know, move, move aside from your bullshit and look at this. And he was right. I mean, you cannot have the modern version of Jose Garcia Lopez and his superhero in, in version without having filtered his romance comic stuff through the scream of Ross Andrew. I mean, Ross Andrew informs Jose Garcia Lopez's work far more than the other superhero man of that time, Gil, uh, 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 Neil Adams. It's not as pretty, Ross's isn't, but it's got volume and it's got structure and weight. And unfortunately, most people know it from, from the Spider-Man stuff, which is the least interesting part of his career. His work is just extraordinary. And Esposito, they were bosom buddies. They were pals. Esposito was like, had, had the manner of a, he was like a, a non-singing member of the Guys and Dolls cast. He was just this racetrack tout. He was just, you know, there were all these, these guys. I mean, when he said that word, when he used the word fan, it was like, you know, I got, I understood completely an entire generation of guys who had fucking had it. <laughs> you know, they were just done with this shit. They were waiting for the train to show up and it was never going to come. You know, it was never happening. Um, you said that, that. I was thinking of like one of my favorite lines in the book to bring it back Mania the wife of fandom that whole, <laughs> just that one line is like that and like the lettering is just perfect companion piece <laughs> when you have scenes like this how much of this is design and production how much of it is you know you doing like the figures in the foreground we kind of talked about this last time Okay. I mean the, the, only, the only thing on that page is not drawn is the last path right that, that's an actual poster from the Chicago Exposition. I mean, this is kind of like a modern day version of paste ups. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I mean, to a certain extent, you know, what I was doing on flag with an X Acto knife and Xeroxes and spray mount prefigured to a great, great extent when I was what I'm doing in Photoshop. I mean, I, in, the, in the early aughts, uh, I scanned all my Zipitone and a whole bunch of patterns. So I have all, all my stuff is on digital now, you know. So uh, Ken, Ken took over production on Hey Kids halfway through issue one of volume three. And, um, you know, what he does is he, you know, he, he, he pays up the zip tone patterns and stuff like this. I give him, I give him explicit notes. Um, and I, I say, here's a place to be ambitious. Here's a place not to be ambitious. He went batshit on the first couple of issues of, of, of populating street scenes, like cut that out. You know, you know, you know I, I, all the, I provide all the figures in, in the backgrounds and he just like move it to you. enough. You know, Give me a skyline, pal. You know, just, you know, don't, don't, don't make yourself crazy, you know? Um, so, I mean, right now, I mean, the first, the first page of issue five um, gives us uh, three, a, three traditional versions of Mad, Madcap, Perun, and Evolutines. And then we see the next generations, the, uh, the post, the post my generation version thereof. And, um, and the reaction to it uh, by Ray Clark, Tony Kramer and Benita Heindel. And um, you know, one of the things that, that that really gets discussed is that, you know, there's there's a whole series of, I mean, pe people tend to lump my generation in with Frank and Bill and, and Dennis, and they're not. It's a diff different generation. And there's this there's this invisible generation that are dying right now, um, born in 38 to 40, you know, Steve Skates, Roy, Roy Thomas, Gil, uh, uh, Steranko, Neil Adams, Tom Palmer. Um, this short, very, a very small generation that, that really informed a lot of what happened in the 70s because they were grown-ups by then. We weren't, really. We were kids. Um, and, I mean, I, I think the real story of Hey Kids 
is the resentment of the old men, the acceptance of the of the, of the middle aged, and then the the new the newly evolved expectations and resentments of the of the new, of the third generation. That's the story. That's really what it's about. Um, and I, you know, one of the one of the tenets of my of my world is that resentments are or expectations are resentments in training. And uh, so many guys came into the comic book business in the in the late '90s, early aughts, on the basis of what they perceived as potential fortune, not recognizing that the the money that was made in the 1990s had absolutely nothing to do with actual actual, you know, fandom, but had to do with 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 what was perceived as marketing potential, and um, and, and investment. I mean, the most comical aspect of working in television in the 90s was meeting a guy who'd been hired by a, as a development guy at a studio as their comic book guy who knew nothing about comics, but he did some study over the weekend, went to Golden Apple and bought a bunch of books. And these are guys who thought that Rob, that Rob Liefeld was good because he because he was perceived as selling a lot of books. You know, Liefeld has always said very nice things about me in print or whatever it is. But let's face it, in, in a world of, of an actual meritocratic business, he'd be painting wizards on the sides of panel trucks. Um, you know, um, but it, it, the work that succeeds in comics is aspirational. It's what it's what the audience would draw like if it could. You know, it's like when I was a kid. You know, we all drew Woody Woodpecker and Fred Flintstone heads on our, on our Hebrew, Hebrew school homework under under Stukas dropping bombs on our Hebrew school homework. You know, um, and that that sensibility survives in many successful talents who deliver the goods. That are the goods that you that, that the audience perceives is what it would do if it had the opportunity to do so. Um, you know, it's 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 difficult to be ambitious to become Jose Garcia Lopez and Neil Adams, but there is certain ambition built into becoming Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld um, because it it looks, you know, it's 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 very it's it's iconic and emblematic. Everything it's a series of tropes reorganized in different different patterns, and that trope based work, you know, it's it's like. It's like beats, you know. It's like it's like like music that that, that has achieved a, a popular success that that are that are more 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 than that. They're earworms. They're inescapable. Is there anything I'm, else I'm, that you're working on aside from the Hey Kids stuff? We're, 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 well, we we are going to do a, a Black Kiss omnibus. With you know, we have there's a Black Kiss omnibus in in German, Italian, and Spanish. There's never been an English English language omnibus, and we are going to do. It. We're, we're, the, we have met, we have made the first moves in that direction. Um, we, and we're just going to publish it. And uh, it'll be next year, and uh, I've got I'm going to do a 20 page story, a new piece, which will you know backhand it all. I'm kind of excited about that, and we're also I'm in the process of negotiating the rights to uh, to do a comic book adaptation of a of a series of of somewhat forgotten novels of the 60s and early 70s that were that really lend themselves to the world that I work in. They're not you know they're, they're not with in space or with superpowers, but they're the kind of work I like. And and the first vo volume of, of two volumes of Sunshine Patriots will be out very soon. That's a uh, quasi western that takes place in the streets of Los Angeles in 1913. Um, again, snatching commercial gold wherever I find it all the time. I'm always rushing that because it's actually by people with shit coming out of their eyes and laser beams in their fingers in space. But no, it's not. Um, uh, what, what's it. happening with that uh, John Romita Jr. book? I'm it's waiting for John to deliver. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't want to, you know, he's making so much money doing commercial shit. Yeah. You know, I, I saw John, I mean, a year ago, I saw John, I had breakfast with John in, at Terrificon in Connecticut, uh, a great show, by the way. And um, we sat down, I said, here's our schedule, let's do it. And he said, yeah. At this I'm, point, I'm, I'm just like, whenever you put it out, just put it out. It's like, fuck it, I'll pick it, it up. Is, it, is so, it is so beautiful. Yeah. It's just lovely. Finish the fucking book, John. I'll talk to him. I'll talk, I thought you told me to say that. Is there anything that we left out or anything you just want to throw out there? I'm just here to chat. You know, you're, you're, you're always fun to talk to. Uh, I'm not, I'm not re re wrestling with my life. I'm, I'm fairly comfortable, you know, commercially and financially. I, I have no complaints that anybody gives a shit about. And it's really pretty comfortable. Who cares what you fucking think? I mean, really.